little while ago I saw a How To's video where they showed how to put a Raspberry Pi in an NES cartridge. It seemed to beg the question, could you actually design a cartridge that played Raspberry Pi games on an NES? I don't think I'd ever even played a real NES before, let alone played with its hardware, but I started examining schematics, reading developer documentation and doing some experiments with emulators. I was hoping the NES cartridge port would have something simple like a composite video pass-through, but nothing's ever that simple, is it? Anyway, two years of false starts and distraction have led me to the point where I basically have a working prototype. I call the project PiPU because it uses a Pi to control the NES's PPU, or picture processing unit. It only runs Doom just now, but in theory anything that runs on the Raspberry Pi could be made to work. For example, Quake, Sonic the Hedgehog, Mario 64, or YouTube. I'm going to go into some detail about how all this works, so if you just want the build guide, skip to blah blah blah. Here's my development setup, which is slightly too big to fit into an NES cart, although it's still smaller than my prototyping setup. It has three main components, firstly and most obviously the Raspberry Pi. It's running Chocolate Doom, which is a very simple version designed to be as close to the DOS original as possible. It's also running a program I've written which converts the Doom output video into a NES compatible format and then transfers it out of the USB port. The second component is this modified Super Mario Bros. cartridge board. The program ROM has been replaced with a custom game that starts up the Nintendo graphics hardware and then handles all the video and gamepad synchronization. The graphics ROM has been replaced with this pin header connector, which connects via this janky circuit board to the third and most important component, the high speed USB controller. The controller is based around Cypress Semiconductor's incredibly flexible FX2 LP chip, and it handles all the communications between the Raspberry Pi and the Nintendo. The way it does this is by emulating a cartridge graphics memory. Now just briefly, memory works like this. The NES is connected to the graphics memory on the cartridge via groups of signals called buses. There's the address bus and the data bus. When the NES wants to access graphics memory on the cartridge, it puts the memory address it wants in the address bus. The memory chip then grabs the data at this address and transfers it to the NES via the data bus. Now, you'd think in order to emulate a memory chip you'd have to watch the address bus to know what data to send back, which would be quite complicated to do. And that's true in general, however the NES accesses memory in the exact same order each time for each frame of video. As we can predict exactly what data it will want at any given time, we can just feed it data in that exact order and ignore the address bus entirely. This means that our logic, circuitry and software can be much simpler. There's another benefit to ignoring the address bus, and it has to do with the way NES graphics work. The NES screen, which is 256 by 240 pixels, is divided into 16 by 16 pixel sections called attribute areas. Each attribute area can only have four different colors displaying at one time, which makes for pretty bad color resolution. The colors that each attribute can display are stored in an area of memory called the attribute table. When the NES wants to check which colors a particular attribute can display, it reads that part of memory. But the NES actually does this 32 times per attribute area, once for each 8 by 1 pixel section of the attribute. Now, the NES looks at the same memory bus address for all of these 8x1 pixel sections, and it's expecting to get the same value back each time on the data bus. But since we're ignoring the address bus, we can feed it a different set of colours for each section, thus fooling the NES into giving us 8x1 pixel attribute areas instead of the normal 16x16 16 pixel, and this results in a much better colour resolution than NES games can normally achieve. However, even with these techniques, at the end of the day we're limited to only 13 different colours on screen at once. We can increase the perceived number of colours with a process called dithering, which is where you deliberately apply noise to the picture. This stops the banding effect you get on colour gradients, but gives the picture a kind of speckly appearance. There are many things that could be done to increase the video quality, such as dynamic palette generation, or using sprites to add additional colours to certain parts of the screen, or even just using a better dithering algorithm, such as one of the ones invented by Joel Uliloma in this excellent article that I'll link to below. I'll leave that as an exercise to others, or possibly future me, who knows. So that's the graphics taken care of, but what about the gamepads? Well the NES CPU handles controller input, and you traditionally speak to the CPU through the CPU bus, but I'm lazy and I didn't want to add any additional hardware. So I figured, we already have the graphics bus hooked up, why not just use that? The CPU can access a graphics bus via the picture processing unit's PPU adder and PPU data registers, and obviously as we're ignoring the address bus we only need PPU data. During the vertical blanking interval, the CPU writes to the graphics bus to send gamepad commands, and reads palette and music information in much the same way. This is all mediated by some very simple FX2LP code to keep everything synchronised. The Raspberry Pi has a number of parallel interfaces that could perhaps be used to eliminate the FX2LP, but they're very poorly documented and would require so much external glue logic and voltage level translators that it would probably use more hardware in the long run anyway. I believe this is the approach taken by Tom Seven in his excellent video series Reverse Emulating the NES. I highly recommend watching them as they cover many of the same concepts in far greater detail than I've gone into. The last thing to talk about is the music. 
The NES has quite a nice custom programmable sound generator built into the CPU. It has two variable duty cycle pulse wave channels, a triangle wave channel, a noise channel and a PCM channel for samples. I used Ableton Live to make suitable arrangements of the Doom music that only used those five channels, then converted them into NES format using an older version of FamiTracker that still supported MIDI files. FamiTracker's MIDI support isn't great however, hence why it was removed entirely in recent versions, so a lot of manual tweaking was required to get everything sounding right. For added authenticity, I actually sampled the drums from the Roland SC55, which was the MIDI synthesizer that Bobby Prince originally used to make the Doom music. Anyway, I want to actually install these components into a cartridge so I can send it to testers, so let's see how we get on. I'm kind of making this up as I go along, so this isn't the most elegant solution, but it should work well. Now I'll provide enough information to be able to build a Doom cartridge without any specific knowledge of the technologies involved here, but you will still need a fair amount of general electronics knowledge and assembly skill to be able to build and troubleshoot this project. If you have trouble reading electronic schematics or you can't solder very well, then this is not the project for you. Let's start with the cartridge itself. I bought a copy of Major League Baseball for less than $2 on eBay to use as the donor cart. I know a lot of collectors get mad at people like me who destroy existing games to make reproductions and so on, and I suppose the proper way to do this would be to get a purpose-built reproduction PCB, but as far as I can tell nobody ships those to the UK for a reasonable price. If you live somewhere where you can get reproduction PCBs and cartridge enclosures fairly cheaply, then I would recommend doing that instead. It would be cool to design something that combined the FX2LP chip and the cartridge connector on a single PCB, but I can't really be bothered, and I very much doubt anyone cares about me defacing Major League Baseball. Anyway, this particular game is a CN-ROM cartridge, which is one of the simplest cartridges available, and unlike many others, including my NROM development cart, it has all the cartridge pins. This is important because we need the right strobe signal to transfer controller input. We start by using a 3.8mm game bit screwdriver to open the NES cart. We need to remove all the ICs except the CIC lockout chip. Since the board is double-sided, these can be kind of a pain to get out in one piece, so I just dremeled all the pins off the ICs and desoldered them individually. Then we need to braid the solder out of the holes, and we have a donor cartridge board all ready to go. Now we need to get the replacement ROM ready. These 28C256 EEPROMs have almost exactly the same pinout as the Nintendo Mask ROMs, so the cart PCB will require minimal hacking. You also need something to program the ROM. These TL866 programmers are available for next to nothing and work really well. While we're on the computer, we might as well write the Raspberry Pi Doom image to an SD card and program the USB controller's firmware too. This last step in particular is quite fiddly, so refer to the full written instructions on GitHub. Now, before we solder the newly written ROM to the board, we have to make some modifications. Again, these are detailed in the full build document on GitHub. Once you've got the board modified and soldered, put it in the cartridge enclosure and give it a test. The game code by default plays the Doom intermission music to let you know it's working. If this doesn't work, check all your connections. Now let's just think about how the other components are going to be laid out inside the cart. We'd struggle to fit the Raspberry Pi 3 I've been using in, but luckily since I started working on the project they brought out a new version, the Raspberry Pi 3A+, which is significantly smaller. Unfortunately, the Raspberry Pi Zero isn't quite powerful enough to run the encoder at a decent frame rate, and although the Raspberry Pi 2B probably is, they never made a smaller 2A version of it. After dremeling out some of the internal plastic supports, it fits very nicely into the enclosure, alongside the cartridge PCB and USB controller. The only problem is that there isn't space for a USB cable, but we can hack an existing mini USB cable and just solder it to the onside of the Raspberry Pi's USB socket. This probably violates all kinds of USB specifications, but it seems to work fine. Now for the most involved step, connecting the USB controller and the NES cart. It would be nice to connect these using a nice neat IDC connector or something, but unfortunately there isn't enough vertical space inside the cart for this, so we'll need to desolder the USB controller's header and solder a bunch of wires to it. To remove headers, I really like these stainless steel desoldering needles. You can just use it to poke the pins straight through and then clean everything up with solder braid. There are around a dozen wires to solder, again details of this are in the full build document, but be careful, some of these cheap FX2 boards have incorrect labelling. In fact this particular one had the RDY0 and RDY1 signals swapped. You're probably best to confirm that at least these signals actually go to the cracked pins on the chip. There's also the right signal to connect, be careful not to get any solder onto the gold edge connector because you'll never get it off. The last connection we need to make is to provide power to the Raspberry Pi. There isn't enough vertical space for a female pin header connector, so I just soldered wires directly to the male 5 volt and ground pins. Now I did do some testing to see how much additional power the whole assembly uses. An NES running a normal game draws about 300 milliamps on its 5 volt rail, and when running with the Doom cart that nearly doubles to about 590 milliamps. The 5 volt regulator on the NES is rated for 1 amp, so that shouldn't be much of a problem on paper, but the NES has a rather insubstantial heatsink arrangement. I generally use the rule of thumb when testing things like this, which is if you can hold your thumb against the IC for more than a few seconds then it's probably okay. And yeah, it doesn't seem to be getting on reasonably hot, but I wouldn't go leaving it on overnight or anything. Anyway, after we've tested it doesn't blow up the NES, it's time to assemble the cartridge. I just used double sided sticky foam pads to hold the Raspberry Pi and USB controller in place, then just screwed the cart together. Of course we'll need a new label for the cart, so after removing the old label with help from a heat gun, we just affix the new label and we're done. 
So yeah, I think that just about covers everything about this project. Have a look at the video description below for links to all the downloads you'll need to build a Doom cartridge, as well as source code in case you fancy improving the project or porting another game to the NES. I just also want to say that this project wouldn't have been possible without the help of people far cleverer than I, so thanks to everyone over on the NES Dev Forum, as well as the countless people who've contributed to reverse engineering and documenting the NES over the last four decades. I should also give a shout out to Tom Seven, who released his annoyingly similar project while I was uh, taking an extended break from this project. His videos are incredible though, so definitely give them a watch. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. I've always got weird little projects like this brewing away in the background, so subscribe and hit the notification button if you want to hear about them, and take a look at my other videos, you might find them interesting. Bye bye!